On behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book, the AJC Decatur Book Festival, DeKalb County Public Library, and DeKalb Library Foundation, welcome to our seventh in the summer reading series, Jocelyn Jackson Reads. We are so very pleased to join with the Decatur Book Festival this year to present this series virtually to you. Many of you may know and may have attended last year when we offered a smaller version of this series. We were so very pleased when Joy Pope, the executive director of the Decatur Book Festival, asked us to come on this year and be a bigger part of this reading series. And we're so happy to do so and so happy to bring so many readers together on this platform. If you would like to know about the other two events that we have coming up in the series, you can find more about those at decaturbookfestival.com or you can just click on the link provided in the chat and go to the Eventbrite page to register. If you take a look at the Decatur Book Festival website, I'd also encourage you, if you have the means, to make a donation to the Decatur Book Festival. It is such a wonderful place for readers and writers to gather yearly, and we hope that in the coming years, we will come back to the full festival weekend that we typically presented to you all. Right now, we're looking at doing a smaller version of the festival in October, just to give you a taste of what's to come in the years down the road. But I'd also like to remind you that if you'd like to purchase a copy of either of our guests' books tonight, you can do so by clicking on the order link provided in the chat from Acapella Books. Acapella Books, like so many of our independent bookstores across the country, have done such a wonderful job during this pandemic, mailing books to our homes, providing contactless pickup, and in some cases, even bringing the books to our doorstep. We'd also encourage you to purchase your books from the Black-owned independent bookstores and businesses around the nation because we truly believe that they will help form a more just society and of course, provide a greater and diverse literary community. If you would like to ask a question after the formal presentation, please do so by typing your question into the Q&A feature that Zoom has. You will find the button for that either at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on your device. And we would also like to remind you that we have live transcription turned on for those of you who require it. You can go into your settings and you can adjust the size and the font color if you need be. Right now, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our guests this evening and get this event started. First, I'd like to introduce Fenderson Jelly Clark. He is the award-winning and Hugo Nebula Sturgeon World Fantasy nominated author of the novellas Ring Shout, The Black God's Drums, The Haunting of Tramcar 15. His stories have appeared online and in venues such as Tor.com, Daily Science Fiction, Heroic Fantasy Quarterly, Apex, Lightspeed, Fireside Fiction, Beneath Ceaseless Skies, and in print anthologies including Hidden Youth and Clockwork, Cairo. He is the founding member of FIA Literary Magazine and is an infrequent reviewer at Strange Horizons. Born in New York and raised in mostly Houston, Texas, he spent his early formative years of his life in his homeland of his parents, Trinidad and Tobago. When not writing speculative fiction, Fenderson works as an academic historian whose research spans comparative slavery and emancipation in the Atlantic world. When so inclined, he rambles on issues of speculative fiction, politics, and diversity in his aptly named blog, The Disgruntled Herodrum. Nevo is the author of the acclaimed novellas, The Empress of Salt and Fortune, and When the Tiger Came Down the Mountain. Born in Illinois, she now lives on the shores of Lake Michigan. She believes in the ritual of lipstick, the power of stories, and the right to change your mind. The Chosen and the Beautiful is her debut novel. Of course, leading our discussion tonight is the co-captain of this series this year, Nikki Salcedo. She is a fantastic moderator and author herself, who truly brings such great light and in-depth questions to this series. And she will be shepherding us through these magical, mysterious, and sometimes murderous worlds that we will be confronted with in the novels tonight. So thank you so much for joining us. And now I'll turn it over to Nikki. Nikki? Thank you. I love that intro, Murderous Worlds. We're gonna have a lot of fun talking about two wonderful books tonight. I am so excited to be here with Fenderson and Nee, and um, I have both of their books here. Um, I recommend them enough. 
we deserve to be transported to new and different worlds. And we're going to talk to these authors a little bit about um, their stories, their writing. Us. Um, and I hope you all will join the conversation. A special thank you to Jocelyn Jackson for being the host of the series and inviting me to partner with her. Um, we've had a fun time getting ready for the summer um, with these novels. Um, my first question, I hope is an easy one um, because I'd love both of these authors to tell me about the premise of their book. So Ni, nee, why don't we start with you and you can tell me a little bit about The Chosen and the Beautiful. Uh, the Chosen and Beautiful is essentially a uh, fanfic of F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, only viewed from a second secondary uh, character who just happens to be uh, queer Vietnamese American and instead coincidentally magical. Coincidentally magical. Yeah, I'm just going to throw that in there for the last just part. A, yeah. Just a little magic. Well, <laughs> um, magic is not necessarily what we got in the original Great Gatsby. Um, what what do you, what made you think of um, bringing magic into this world? Uh, I'm a fantasy writer. If um if I, if I can't have magic and I can't have dragons, I'm not sure why I'm bothering. But on the other hand, there's also the fact that you know one of the real joys of the original Great Gatsby is the fact that we're in the 1920s when there was so much change and so much uh, upheaval. And honestly, it was the advent of electricity that made me bring the magic into it. The idea that um, electricity would have been magical in many ways. You still have, you have cities that are being gridded out and um, lights that never turn off. And at the same time, you have homes that are still off the grid that are still using lamps and wood stoves and candles. And you know, it was very much that dichotomy and that transition that made me think that magic has to be here and it won't even look that different. Great. And Fenderson, in your story, magic is maybe everything. I'd love to hear your perspective about the world you've built and the story that you've brought to us. Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, this story is set in an alternate uh, 1912 Cairo, Egypt, where magic has uh, returned to the world and it's changed the world. And uh, with the advent of magic, of course, in all these changes, you're going to need a bureaucracy. And so we have a bureaucratic institution by the name of the Ministry of Alchemy, Enchantments and Supernatural Entities. And the story basically follows an agent by the name of Fatma who works for this agency. And uh, the various cases, in this case, a really prominent case that uh, she's put upon. So in your story, we have a magical world, but maybe a traditional type of mystery that we're going to follow along to see who done it. Yeah, it's uh, in some ways it's it's a traditional mystery, um, but of course I have magic, and so mm -hmm. I think, like me said, I'm the same way. Like if if I can't put magic in it, then what's the point? <laughs> and so I was like, I, I could I could give a traditional detective story, but you add magic into it, and well, the stakes up tremendously, right? And what is possible uh, can you know expands, and so. At, at, at the heart of it, um, I don't even know if I thought of it as I'm writing a detective novel. I thought of like I'm writing a magical story. Uh, it just so happens that there is a mystery to solve. Excellent. And your story came from an earlier work, a novella. Yeah. Um, I'd love because both of you actually have um, history writing novellas. Yeah. Um, maybe Fenderson, starting with you. <laughs> You have an idea, it's a novella, and then what brings you to this fuller work of fiction? Uh, luck, chance, and readers. Uh, when I when I first, the first published work for this was actually a novelette, not even a full novella. Mm. Uh, that, that rare beast, <laughs> the novelette, <laughs> which um, was published on tour.com in 2016, in May uh, 2016. And, when that was published, I didn't have anything else in my arsenal for this world, uh, other than I had left a lot of doors open to go a lot of different places if I was ever moved to do so. Um, the fact that people liked it <laughs> helped mm -hmm. inspire me to do more. And so that's how the novella, The Haunting of Tram Car 015 came about. And people liking that made me say, I guess I have to write a book. Um, and so none of this was planned. Uh, there, there was no larger plan that I'm going to write a novelette, novella, and a book. 
uh, it happened to come along as the need arose. I love when an author admits the lack of planning, because I think it's so easy to say, well, you know, I had my sticky notes and a grid. Why lie? Why lie? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes we're writing by the seat of our pants. Basically. <laughs> Nee, what about you? You had um, two novellas as well. Um, did that influence your ability to write The Chosen and the Beautiful? Uh, yes, yeah, sort of, because um, I had written my very first novel uh, right before I wrote my first novella. And what happened was I realized that Tor had a call, had an unagented call for submissions out for novellas. And I saw that the minimum word count was 20,000 20, words. And I said, I can write 20,000 words. <laughs> Uh, so I did, and it, and I was very lucky that Rushi ended up liking it. Uh, Rushi Chen over at Tor.com, who is my editor, and she's fantastic. Um, and um, so after that, I was like, okay, I've written at least one novel, which is Siren Queen, which is coming out next year. And I've written a novella, and um, I have an agent now, which is, which is a weird progression of events that all took place in about two to three weeks there. And, you know, I was writing another novel and, you know, I was talking with my agent, Diana Fox, and she said, so you got anything else going on? I'm like, sure. And I sort of pitched, um, I sort of half absently pitched what would become Chosen and the Beautiful. Mm -hmm. And when I got done pitching it, there was this kind of silence and I'm like, oh, cool. Did that one actually lose me my agent? That's kind of funny. <laughs> and uh, she said, okay, me, nee, I need you to stop writing what you're writing now. And I need you to write that instead. I'm like, okay sure whatever so that's that was the the very awkward transition that 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 first novel is still half finished but if it stays half finished and in return i got chosen i'm i'm okay with that <laughs> so the path isn't straight um in terms of how your story is light and i love that um you said i could write twenty thousand words so for our attendees for writing um you can write 20,000 words, you could write 200,000 words, um, and that you just said, okay, yes, I'm going to write this. My career it, trajectory is sort of like a, a sort of very confused pinball is about where I am. Yeah. If me is anybody like me, uh, I don't know about anybody, I'm an overwriter. And so <laughs> it tends to be when I would first aim for short stories, back a long time ago when I first started writing my shorts, I would end my short stories and be like, I am done with this short story at 20,000 words, right? And it had nowhere to go because there was no novella program at Tor at the time. And so there was nothing to do. And so, yeah, being told like, hey, could you expand that to a novella? Well, can I? <laughs> it's not hard. <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm too lazy for that. It, it's, you know, it, it's 20,000 words and then I'm done. I get to go play. Um, yeah. I had this project where I was writing like I was writing like a hundred word story a day for about two or three years and I think that did something to me so I was I'm like I'm like as short as possible and then I'm done and that's that's that really helps so so two different approaches either overwrite or write short moral of the story is though both of you um have been so just keep writing um, in a way to get your stories out. Um, I am going to remind our attendees um, to put questions in the Q&A because um, that's where I'm going to check. Um, and I am going to just pop over there right now because Jocelyn, um, who is our host for the series, had a uh, comment and she said, um, I was so excited to see you were the pick for Fantastic Strangelings Book Club. Congrats. That's a big deal. And when did you find out? And so, Nee, can you tell us about that? Was that for you? Strange Lames Book Club? I'm not familiar. That's news to me. Okay. So Hooray. thank you. Thank that's that's wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to well, thank my mom and my dad. And yeah. no, that's that's news and to me. The the Academy. Thank the Academy mm -hmm. always. Um and then the next question was um for Fenderson, um, the detective aspect of your book. Um was it tricky to play fair um, in writing a mystery in a world where magic exists? So can you play fair in a world with magic? So that's the next question. I, I think so. I think, you know, you could always, you know, I, I call it, you could always great gazoo or cue it where you just snap your fingers and <laughs> everything happens that you need, but that would be boring. And so I think even when you're writing with magic, you need some kind of rules, you need some kind of boundaries and restrictions. 
you need a logic even to your magic. And so I think once I was sticking to that logic, that there were things that could be done and things that could not be done, um, you know, I could I could have the mystery flow just as well. It's just it's just a mystery that probably would make me pay attention because I don't normally watch or read a lot of mysteries, but I tend to read them if they're in a form where there's magic, right? Because I like that added element. And so I know I don't think it was it wasn't really that difficult uh, to do because the world that I was building, like I said, it, it was it had boundaries and it had limits and it had its own form of logic. Excellent. And um, I'd love just to delve a little bit more into your worlds. So you're both in the early 1900s. Um, Ni, you mentioned maybe magic was even electricity. Um, you know, what were things that were magical in our regular world or in this alternate universe? Uh, we've created two very distinct cultures. So um, the world of Great Gatsby now to us does seem like fantasy. It doesn't seem real. Um, and when we're in this magical Cairo, um, you've both had to kind of build a, a world for us to believe because we're so far removed. Um, I'd love to know about the setting of your story um, and how uh, bring these two very unique women. So I'm going to ask you a setting question and about these strong female characters. So Nia, I'll start with you on Jordan and how did how do we find her? How do we get in touch with her in this world? Uh, Jordan has this really fun perspective of being someone who, um, like one of my great literary icons, Tay Shonigan, does a lot of observing and is not necessarily very nice about it. Um, and the thing about Jordan is uh, I had to world build very weirdly around her, as in, uh, I know how the magic works. The magic absolutely, like, uh, like Fen says, does play by rules. But the thing is, Jordan doesn't care. Jordan's got other things going on, like how well she's dressed, how well everyone else is dressed, how much fun she is having. And so it was a special kind of pain when I went to write Jordan and she does not care about any of the construction I'm doing. She is not looking at that at all. Mm -hmm. But when it comes right down to the world building on that part, I would have to say that the biggest and funnest part about creating the world that Jordan lives in is the idea of the attainability of wonder. Um, in the 1920s, mm. advertisement was actually doing this thing where people believed in it, and it wasn't this thing you clicked five or six times so you could finally get to your article. Um, it was actually this thing that was showing people this world of wonder that they could have, that they could have it on a payment plan, which, you know, eventually does have some very, very bad consequences. But um, it was the attainability of it. The fact that it was, you know, it, it's, it's right there, you can have it, everyone can have it. And that's not true, and that's never been true, but they believed they could for, you know, a little bit of a decade. And mm -hmm. that, that was sort of the, the basis for it. So Jordan's a character who likes to have fun. She doesn't follow the rules of magic. And yet we're also seeing characters we believe we're familiar with. So we we feel like we know the, the world of Great Gatsby, um, but we're really getting a deep look into Jordan and she is a special kind of person. Um, Fenderson in your world. Um, Fatma is kind of young and up and coming. Maybe um, she's trying to earn her place in society. Um, tell us about her and um, the hierarchy of, of this world, the bureaucracy. Yeah, you know, Fatma was the center of this entire world. When I when I first thought this up, I I think it was Fatma who came fully conceived in suit and all and bowler. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that opening scene with the dead Jin, and then from there it's almost as if I built the world around her as a person who would be moving within this world and you know thinking of the things that she would be interacting with. Um, at the same time when I look back and I think of what was influencing me at the time, as I always point out, um, I was I was teaching a lot of um, world history on anti-colonialism. I would just read some Said, so as I always say, this story arose somewhere between Ponte Corvo's the Battle of Algiers and <laughs> Edward Said, right? And so in many ways, I was trying to tell an anti-colonial story, but in a way that was in a way that was layered, right? With uh, fantastic things, with a bit of fun and everything else. I was trying to find a way to speak about a what if about colonialism. How could things have gone differently? And it was in my thinking, like, well, what, what would thwart industrialization and empire and a Maxim gun 
is where I landed on magic. <laughs> right? <laughs> magic would be the thing that would that would thwart that. And from there, and in thinking up this story with Fatma, the world just kind of expanded around her. Right. And so it was a matter of she's part of this bureaucracy. I started thinking, well, what kind of world would this be if magic has arrived and there are jinn who live among people and they go to work and they play with people and they interact and they, you know, they're on the train and they're on the tram car. And as I was thinking this up is where I, you know, the world itself uh, grew. And I would say the world really grew just before I did um, the haunting of Tramcar 015, because like I said, when I wrote uh, Adegion in Cairo, I hadn't thought I would be doing more in this world. And so I left doors open um, from places to go, but I hadn't, I hadn't really peeked, put my head through and taken a look. And so before I wrote the haunting of Tramcar 015, I, I kind of fleshed out the world. Um, and I've been using that template in a sense, though it's been grown, of course, with a novel, it grows even more. Um, but that's how I've been able to maneuver in this world and have Fatma as this person in this world. How would I describe Fatma? Um, she is driven. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, she's a person who, you're correct, in some, in some ways she's out of place and she doesn't care. Uh, she's a person who will walk into a place where it is not thought that she belongs and simply uh, take her place there and plant her flag. Um, you know, at the same time, she's also a person who is perfectly suited for her job. Not everyone can do this, even though magic is back. Uh, the ministry exists as a, as kind of like this buffer zone between everyone and the supernatural, right? If you can go to bed at night and not worry about things because you know, the ministry is keeping things under wraps, right? And so there are ways of seeing the world and dealing with things that the average person in this world does not have to encounter. And Fatma is able to exist in both of those, you know, and go home and sleep at night, uh, knowing the uh, wondrous and supernatural things that she does. Well, I'm wondering if either of you made a conscious decision about your um, main characters who are these women sort of outside of society and yet um, very representative where they're from maybe um, issues of race, of gender, sexuality, that are part of the story, but not necessarily, you know, you know, given as the moral of the story is, this is just part of who the characters are. Um, was it an easy choice for you to bring these type of women to the page? Um, or was it a challenge? Ni, nee, what do you think? I think that, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, and as I actually say this, it's it's uh, weirdly appropriate. But Jordan is a car crash of intersection of intersectional identities. She has, yeah, yeah. I just I had to once I thought it, I had to say it. Um, I, I think, and I think that's um, that's just reality. I I don't know how many of my friends actually only have one politically charged identity. I certainly don't. Um, and it's, it's just a matter of living in the world and saying that our stories aren't our stories aren't extra they just are our stories and they're just stories that maybe have um more adjectives but it's not it's not like um it's not like legos you know it, it's not like you know you have a main story and here's this part this is this is another whole even if it is a, a fragmentary whole which I, i'm hoping that comes through but it is still uh, a thing on its own um, so it's just, you know, Jordan is many things and mostly it all boils down to whether or not she gets to go to the fun party tonight. Mm -hmm. And, and we want her to go to the fun party, right? That's, that's joy. And, um, having a whole character, I think is enjoyable to read. Um, so from my perspective, reading someone who I think might be like somebody I know um, is great. Um, Fenderson with Fatma, um, how did you get into her head? How did you create this character? Yeah, it's like I think, like I said, when, when she arrived, there's something about walking around with a cane and a bowler that told me exactly who she was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the fact that she has to often deal as being the only woman there, a person with, I, I love that, by the way, a car crash of intersectional identity person with various identities who has to move throughout this world and 
part of my thinking about her was thinking about someone who is this driven, who I like admire her work ethic because I don't have that level of work ethic that she does. And this determination, this almost stubbornness um, to to get these things right, to get through these cases, how she can become almost obsessed with uh, figuring them out. Um, and I had to think of what would a person like that, what's going to be like to move through this world in her body, right? And with all these identities that she shares, what are going to be her challenges? What, yeah. how is she going to interact and react to different things? And so I always, what I tried to do was, I don't know that I was trying to make her a strong character as much as I was trying to make her, want her a complex one, right? Which I yeah. hoped I brought out in the book, right? That uh, she has complex motives to what she's doing. And, you know, uh, I think you, if you think of all of her different identities, she brings them to bear and who she is. Mm -hmm. It's like Fatma and Jordan both deserve these big worlds to be in. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, big worlds that feel real, like accessible. Um, it doesn't feel like you went into, you know, the Wizard of Oz, it feels like maybe, maybe I might wa walk down the street. Um, maybe I would get invited to the party. Um, you've both played, though, directly with history. So we talked a little bit about magic. Um, but there is a historical context for both of your stories. Um, and then these stories end up, um, last week, we talked about myth and mythology authors and had a really fun conversation. And I stuck on the idea of myth. And as I was thinking about these books, um, fantasy and magic is a type of mythology, and then you're weaving it together with history. Um, what do you trust more, history or the mythology magic? Leading question. <laughs> Fenderson, how about you? I will say both. I'm going to answer. I'm going to, I'm going to cut it dead down the middle and say <laughs> that, you know, um, I certainly enjoyed playing around with history here. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I like the idea of, you know, finding, thinking, okay, I've altered history, magic is back. What does this mean, right? What does this mean for not just Egypt? What does it mean for the world? Um, how does it alter the historical world that we know? And so it was fun to play around with some of those, some of the historical things that we know that happened and, you know, shifting those around a bit and seeing uh, and trying to imagine what the world might be like, right? So there, for instance, there are anti-colonial movements happening throughout the world now because magic is everywhere and, you know, European empires are on the run. And so I tried to imagine what's that going to be like, but I also, in a sense, tried to look at this Egypt that I was creating as this, you know, when we say post-colonial, it's almost ironic now because we think of, well, post-colonial actually meant neo-colonialism. So I tried to think of what would, a, what would an Egypt look like that was quote unquote, truly post-colonial, right? Where mm -hmm. it has the power to not have to worry about interfering uh, imperial interlopers, right? It has the power to self-determine itself and yet it still has to deal with all of the issues that are human issues, right? It's, it, it hasn't, it's not a utopia. It still has to contend with issues of race, issues of color, gender, class, and what have you. Um, the only difference is, like I said, it gets to do so uh, without interference from outside. So, you know, that's, I guess that's the world that I was hoping to create. Mm -hmm. People would find of interest. And the magic just, you know, helps bring it all along. <laughs> I, I'm firmly with history and magic. I think it's a great combination. And me nee, and your story, um, because you revisited Great Gatsby, was that book coming into public domain um, in any way influencing your decision to write this um, as part one of the question or was that decision already made? And then tell us a little bit about the history and, and magic intertwined in your story. Um, in all fairness, uh, it was absolutely the um, arrival of the Great Gatsby in the public domain that uh, impelled me to write it because uh, I had that conversation with Diana Fox basically around about the early part of uh, 2019 and I wrote The Chosen and the Beautiful in about four months so you know it, it's you can it's that's one of those things where you can feel history breathing down your neck um, and when it comes to the idea of faith in history and magic I think I'm going to just sprint my way to the other end of the spectrum and say I'm not sure I believe in either of them um, my personal relationship with history um you know seen through the eyes of my parents and my grandparents is fragmentary 
And you know, it's that great line from the um, uh, the first Men in Black movie. Uh, Just imagine what you what you you'll know tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure if I have. I mean, I was I I was you know I went to public school in the Midwest. I was taught one very specific version of history. I gradu I I go to um, a Big Ten university. I'm taught another history. I grow up and I start doing my own research. I find yet more history, and you know, I every time you think you find the truth, and as you get older, I feel you start to mostly. It feels like at this point, I have faith in my ability to evaluate information, to assimilate new information, and to try to let it make me a kinder and more effective human being in the world. Um, I think that uh, when it comes down to magic in the world of um, in Jordan's world, I think it boils down to power again. And I think we all have feelings about how much we trust power and who uses it and who has it. And so I don't think my trust belongs there either. So at, at that point, I think it's important. Those are important. History and magic are important things to account for. Uh, but I think your faith might be better placed elsewhere, or at least I know mine is. <laughs> I love that. Um, and your journey through history, um, which sounds like maybe it's not ever ending. You're going to keep learning about history in, in new ways and um, everyone's different perspective. Is that not of writing fiction that we are? inventing our own history here. Um, you've given us the story that, um, what if, what do you think? Um, I think that I'm making up a lot of things. And I think mm-hmm. that uh, I know in other works, I have absolutely made fantasy look enough like history that I've tricked some people. And that's been a fun and very strange place for me to be. It's, I'm like, okay, that's believable. I better not see this on a BuzzFeed list somewhere, you know? (laughs) Um, And I think that's another part of how malleable history is. Um, It's it's very strange for me now. Um, My entire publishing career has taken place in the pandemic. Um, We, Empress came out uh, right basically in the same week as lockdown. So I have no idea what the regular publishing world looks like, but I do know that Empress has gotten enough attention that it is being taught in, um, in a few classrooms. Here and there, oh, good. which is wonderful and deeply humbling, and you know, in my darker moments, a little, a little distressing even because you know, that's for like real writers. That's that's for <laughs> it's it's very strange and it's very odd and it's made me think much more uh, comprehensively about you know what does what does history mean and what does it mean to find a place in it, and uh, so you know that's that that whole thought is still under construction, I think. I can appreciate that. And Thunderson gave a really big smile when you made the comment about um, writing something that somebody might believe. Um. <laughs> I, I'm smiling because, well, in my, in my other life, I'm, as you pointed out in the intro, I'm an academic historian. And so mm-hmm. I, it, it's interesting I have a lot of students who it's interesting how, as I always always tell my colleagues, uh, we are not the final arbiters of history. Uh, people are coming, students are coming to us with having learned history from film, from books, and what have you. Mm-hmm. Uh, fiction, or I mean, I don't even want to go into how many how many times I've had to tell them that Gladiator is is not historically accurate. <laughs> you know, things like that, and yet it's also a bridge to talk about those things, right? And so um, I think people are often going to look at the things we create, even if they're fantastical, they're going to go in there, they're going to look for those tidbits of history. And it can be, I think it can sometimes be really helpful in teaching history. And so I'm I'm actually happy that uh, your book is being taught, you know, in classes, because I'm, even if it's being taught as literature, uh, what you can do is you can go in there and talk about the history and you can talk about the fantastic at the same time. I think you can do both. Um, someone once, someone asked me, one of the teachers, one of the professors asked me to, uh, a few questions on email once about it. And they're like, is there anything you want to push forward? And I'm like, let's talk about the unreliability of the narrator and the writer. Let's start there. <laughs> that's, that's about, uh, I'm like, that's, yeah. we'll just, we'll just call that an overarching career theme, I think. Right. 
It's fun for us as readers. The unreliable narrator is is the very favorite. I have to ask this question um, as a lover of romance um, for each of you to tell me a little bit about the love stories that we're seeing in your there's a love interest or um, interesting relationships and um, thank you A for doing this but um, I'd love to hear your perspective on the love or romance element in your story. Um, Fenderson how about you first? Sure I think uh... <laughs> Well, it's funny, um, again, how this story grows. When, when I first had Fatma meet, to give away spoilers, uh, Siti in, um, in uh, Dejit in Cairo, you know, I was like, should I ship them? Should I not? Should I ship them? Should I not? <laughs> and it turned out everybody had already shipped. Everybody was like, oh, I got to. I didn't like flirtation, but I didn't. So I think when I wrote, I kind of hinted at it a bit uh, in The Haunting of Femcar 015, where both make cameos. Um, even though they don't meet, you can get the idea something's happening. And so I think with the novel, I would said, you know, I said, I'm not going to go down the whole, oh, they're still meeting and they're talking and they're, they're, you know, they're trying to exchange and they're still flirting. I was like, no, they're just going to be in a relationship. All right? <laughs> Let's cut to the chase. People want to see them in a relationship. It's been this yes. long. Let's let it happen. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's a, they've had a summer romance for one and everybody knows how summer romances are. Uh, there's something about them that is, you know, wild and, uh, daring and then uh, reality sets in a bit. And mm. so uh, they are two figures who are um, trying to figure out where they are, trying to figure out how they fit in this world, um, how they fit with each other, uh, with everything else going on. Right. But they're, uh, I, I don't want to give it away. I don't, I'm trying not don't to give, give it, too much don't, away. Don't give it away. <laughs> but just speak broadly, but just. But they are, you know, they're dealing with what everyone has to deal with in relationships with trust and, you know, love and everything else. But there's also magic and perhaps the world might end. So, you know, those are things that have to happen. And, and ho hopefully. And who doesn't deal with that? <laughs> yeah. On our way to the grocery store, the world might end. Uh, magic. Uh, That's, uh, that happened to me today, actually. So. Yeah, um, there you go. Me, what about your story? Because we do have a love there. What do you, what would you like to say about that? Well, I think the first thing I should probably say about that is I'm going to be 40 this year and that makes me nearly twice as old as Jordan is. And I think that offers a lot of perspective into how I wrote Jordan and uh, mm. Jordan being a lot of the instincts I remember from being a romantic and sexual 20 year old mm -hmm. and I think if there's any sort of theme um about that I have going on about love in the chosen and the beautiful which is an important uh one of the important poles that I wrap the whole story around it's the idea that the love is real it is tangible it is dangerous there are a lot of different kinds about it and some love isn't meant to last. It doesn't mean it's less real. It doesn't mean it's less it's less wonderful. And it doesn't mean it doesn't help you grow. But some love definitely needs to end. And I think that's something that's a little bit hard to grasp when you're in your 20s, or especially when you're in your, your young 20s. And, you know, everything feels so big and so grand, not only because, you know, you are having, uh, it's, you know, there's the, the, the idea of first love or the idea of you know real love or adult love or sexual love or romantic love and um and then you're dealing with all of these uh silent expectations as well um possessive love um love that is not considered real by other people love that is considered mm -hmm. lesser for one reason or another and i kind of want to dig into that and i'm not i i don't uh god is, is it a spoiler to say how jordan romantically ends the uh and it's novel. I think the ship sailed on that one, right? Well, no, uh, don't okay. let us let, right. let us read it. But just you know, broadly. But I love what you just said, which is so important because I said I love love, um, but love is not perfect, and love does require work. And you know, after the summer is over. Um, it's you gotta get to work and find the killer and you gotta, you know, get to the next party and you have to say thank you to that love. Um, and I love every kind of love story. Um, and especially when um, it reflects our true experience. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, we're not all going to, you know, be at the, the head of the Titanic with Leonardo DiCaprio, um, or, or maybe I will, but you won't. But um, what what you've shown in the story, I think, is is quite accessible to the readers. Um, so I did want to make sure we touched on the love element because um, there is a good bit of, you know, action and magic and, and mystery in the stories, but there's also this very um, interesting love element. I do um, want to go to some of uh, the questions in A. Um, this question says, would you write a novel in the world of Black God's drum, especially thinking of the chances there to ask, what if? Uh, so, yeah, sure, why not? It, it would be kind of cool if I wrote a whole novel in it, wouldn't it? Uh, so yeah, <laughs> um, sure. And though people have asked me if the world of the Black God Drums is the same as the world of a dead gene in Cairo, and it's not, and people really want me to ship those two worlds, and I can't figure out a way to do it, so I'm sorry. But yeah, um, I have thought about uh, doing a novel, and who knows? Um, so that the doors must, open. That must be a question from Superfan, and I love when we have Superfans in attendance, so thank you for that question. The follow-up question is, um, what does magic mean to you all? Um, because magic is not um, the same to each of us. So what does magic mean? Um, Ni, nee, what does magic specifically mean for you? Power. Magic absolutely power. means power. Yeah. It is the ability to change things and it is the ability to keep things the same. And it is the ability to force my, my will on a world that doesn't necessarily want me to do so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about you? How about you? Yeah, I mean that's that's great, but I I think in this sense it's it's also magic here is it defies the natural world. It uh it is a force that is now causing human beings to reckon with their own place in the world. Uh you find out that well, you've always believed in Jin. Somebody's brother's cousin said they once saw a Jin, or they're certain a Jin lives here. But now they are corporeal beings that walk about, and they're doing these wondrous things. And you have to deal with the fact that science doesn't always answer everything any longer. <laughs> and so um, this is a world that human beings are trying to live out their regular lives in, in the midst of all this fantastic. And it's causing them to question even their own place in the world and where they fit in. So it's going to cause identity crises and everything else. And um, there's a way that this world, uh, with the arrival of magic, magic is also chaotic. And because you can't often pin it down, even if it has rules, it sometimes flows out of its container and does what it wants. <laughs> and so there's a way that this world, while running, there, there, one of the reasons it always seems to be precarious and tilting on a on a knife's edge because there's always the chance that magic with all of its power, with power that sometimes can't be controlled, um, could end up dooming everything. It can either create great things or it can destroy. And so, uh, you know, I guess I'm, I'm playing around with metaphors or just before the First World War, you know, go mm -hmm. with it where you will. Um, but certainly um, that's how magic figures into this world. So it's, it's something that's fantastic, but it's also dangerous and frightening at times. So magic is chaos, magic is power, um, and those have to be, um, you know, big themes in both of your stories. Um, and and definitely no spoilers. But it can spoilers. also be fun. <laughs> <laughs> magic can also be lots of fun. Magic should be fun. Earlier on, Ni nee said, you know, wh why wouldn't I, you know, have a story that has a dragon in it? And Thunder said, I I believe you have once referenced your dog as a dragon. Yeah, so, he's somewhere here. Uh, yes, I have a pet <laughs> dragon who, he just resembles a Boston Terrier, but don't let him fool you. But it happens to be a dragon. So each of you have your dragons, um, you know, more dragons in your next story. I'm wondering um, about, do you ever been writing a contemporary story? We've delved a lot into history. What are you, the current world just too of magic and mystery? Um, Fenderson, what about you? Yeah, I'm trying to think. It's really funny. The the one thing I I don't write a lot of futurist stories, um, and I always get these calls like, "Would you like to be in our futurist Octavia Butler type anthology?" And I was like, "Well, I, don't, I haven't written." <laughs> sure, but I don't know if you've ever seen me write anything futurist. 
Um, maybe it's because I'm a historian. I'm often somewhere in the past. But yeah, mm -hmm. I have thought about certain. I have thought about more contemporary stories, and uh, there's a lot going on. Um, and I've I've dabbled in that with short stories, or not have gotten published. Whether I'll whether I'll uh, tap into that, I don't know. There's, I think, like me, will agree. You have so many ideas and so little time. <laughs> there are more ideas that I have, and I think just like me, like a book comes along, and like this is what has to come out right now, and mm -hmm. the other stuff has to wait. And so, uh, perhaps, um, but right now, it's uh, people are gonna have to go back to the past with me for a while. Stick with the past. Well, Nee said, you know, twenty thousand words. I'm just gonna write that in four months. Yeah. I'm just gonna have a book. So. Are you going to ever bring us into contemporary time? Um, okay. Uh, my first instinct is to say no, because I'm really mm -hmm. booked out for a while. But on the other hand, there's this sort of, um, I was reading some interesting stuff about serial killers and the idea of whether serial killers have always been with us or whether they are a product of the rise of urbanization. And I'm completely undecided on there, but there's probably a book there. It's probably, you know, it's probably in there somewhere. Oh, that sounds exciting. Yeah. Um, so you've given us each a little glimpse into your writing process. And I'm wondering if there was a part of your story that was either very difficult to write or your favorite. And like now the book is out in the world. You just super love it. In the original days of book events, you know, you would stand at the podium and you would read, you know, some of chapter one. But what I want to know is like, what's your favorite part? Like what part of your story are you most proud of? Maybe you could explain the scene or the setup. Um, me? Um, okay, I think my very favorite parts to write uh, is a pretty big spoiler. It's deeply bloody and I, I love it to bits, but a very close to second is probably the Magical Gay Club because you know, I remember being young and queer and going to my first uh, gay club and it was absolutely nothing like what I wrote in the book, but I had a very clear idea of what I wanted it to be. A little bit less sticking to the floor. I'm going, I'm going to be perfectly honest there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, the, the Cendrion was so much fun to write. That is excellent and, and fun for us to experience as a reader. So it, it, the magic involves also cleaner floors. I like the practicality of yeah. um, the imagination. Um, Fenderson, difficult part, yeah, favorite part. I just part. want to tell me my favorite part of one of my favorite parts uh, in your book was uh, when she visits the, I don't know what it was, with the where she learns that, oh, other people can do the, I don't, I don't want to give away the spoilers, the magic with scissors and paper. <laughs> right? I used to work and, in a Chinese restaurant that, that yeah, probably plays right into I it. Love the, I love the, the vaccine and like, like, yeah, that's nice what you're doing, but look at this, <laughs> right? <laughs> I think that was, I thought that was great. I, I always thought it was great because you're, you're playing around there with that whole, like an alienation from culture and, you know, being part of a group and not part of a group. And then you find yourself among more familiar people, but yet it's still unfamiliar. Um, and I think that's a, that's a, that's a diaspora experience <laughs> that I've, seen many a time and experienced many a time so uh, i'm when still I, bad at this how am i still yeah. bad at this <laughs> yeah when I, I i i go back to my parents home on trinidad tobago and they, they call me yankee foreigner right that's what i am uh, i'm the yankee even though i i lived there for a while and some of them are like no you lived here for a while it's like no you're still yankee foreigner because his accent's gone and everything else so i think it's an experience i just wanted to point that out i just i like that scene oh. stayed with me um among among many others <laughs> in that book which was a wild retelling of the great Gatsby. Uh, but for myself, um, oh man, I, I don't, I don't want to give it away. Yeah. There, there are so many little bits in there that, you know, I tickled myself when I'm writing and I'm kind of laughing. Uh, and I, I, I guess my favorite would probably have to do with a certain crocodile God. Like I think every time he showed up, I, I laughed and I snickered. <laughs> Because, you know, a chain smoking crocodile god uh, was just just a figure that, you know, I was like, why not? Why not throw this figure in here? Kind of like to throw people off every once in a while. And so um, that was whenever I had to got a chance to write a bit of him. Uh, he, he has a penchant for listing out his titles. Um, I had fun. I, I have a theory that um, when you have a favorite part of the book, um, the readers can tell. So <laughs> yeah. as, as a reader, 
we can guess the part that you really enjoyed writing, you put yourself into. Um, and so just a thank you again, because um, this is a gift to us. And, and all um, season we've been talking about books and um, I cannot uh, reaffirm how much your writing is a gift to people you don't know. Um, these different stories taking us into new worlds and giving us um, different perspectives, I think. Um, is a very important magical power. Writing is a magical power that you both um, have given us. Um, Jocelyn has a question and she said, I love both these books. We, we have been fighting over the books all season. Um, is it too personal to ask where you find yourself in these stories or can you? I love that question. Mm. Okay, big smile from me. Nee. Um, okay, um, all right. The place where I find my, like, I have very little to do with Jordan, you know, one, I've gotten a lot of credit for writing the parties really well, and I'm beginning to think you can only write parties well when you kind of hate them, but <laughs> the place where Jordan, where I meet Jordan is, do you remember those house parties, you are, you're 18, 17, 19, 20, they're, they're so big and they're so bright and someone is offering you things you shouldn't have. And for some reason, they all seem to end with a friend crying on the stairs and you all decide, okay, fuck it, we're, we're, we're going to the diner, okay? The, the diner will fix this, bad pancakes fix this. And that's where I find myself in The Chosen and the Beautiful. That's, that's, that's it. The big, the big party scene, friend crying on the stoop. We've we do know that. Yes, I'm not we've proud, we've all been there. And I'm guessing, Fenderson, you have not been a crocodile smoking god, but no. maybe. But, some... but I'd, I'd like to be, maybe. I don't even smoke, but why not? If I can be a crocodile god, then <laughs> maybe I'll, I'll pick up the habit. You got to um, do the cosplay. I, I don't know I where I would I would fit into this world. I'm more so the person coming in, eating popcorn and watching, like, <laughs> wow, this is actually happening. You know, um, I, I don't think I can pull off, I'm like I always say, I'm Fatma's wardrobe consultant, but don't think I could pull it off uh, myself. And so, no, I, I don't I don't know other than um, perhaps uh, City Snark is born of my own uh, love of sarcasm. So perhaps in her, there's a little bit of my snarky, uh, don't care sarcasm. The, well, it's uh, also hidden us, so things we recognize and don't um, recognize. Um, one final question um, that I, I like is um, about research. And so researching Egypt, researching 1920s New York, um, Nee, did you have to research outside of the Great Gatsby or did you just kind of let Great Gatsby be your guide? Uh, actually, um, the best part was actually going through and rereading The Great Gatsby and underlining mm -hmm. everything. I wasn't absolutely certain I knew uh, what it was about. Um, mm -hmm. Daisy's Twilight Sleep, Nick's Regiment, what a hydroplane is, which was much harder than I thought it was, than I thought it was going to be. Um, but basically, if you just start and you know, this is something that she says in The Empress of Salt and Fortune, you'll never remember the great if you don't remember the small. And I find that the smaller and more granular my research goes, the better I am at seeing the whole. So that was actually a really great experience to start with things I don't get from The Great Gatsby and then just sort of expand out into a world of medical horror and discrimination and war history. <laughs> you went straight from the beauty into the terror. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah as all good stories do. And you're a historian, um, Fenderson, so the history was probably just already inside of you? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't say that because as, as I tell people on the airplane who tell me when they say, what do you do? I'm a historian. Oh, well, I'm a bit of a historian myself. And then they <laughs> start asking me about the Peloponnesian Wars. And I say, look, I, I'm, I'm not a historian of everything human beings have ever done everywhere. <laughs> I have a distinct thing. And so I, I knew some things. I knew a smattering. Uh, it's better to say I knew where to look. Uh, and I probably bought those tools to bear of research where I could understand what I needed to look for and and when I need to stop researching. I'm probably not going to oh, figure yeah. out how long a city block in Cairo is. I don't care how long I search for it in 1912. It's going gonna, it's gonna to befuddle me, and I'll just mm -hmm. have to deal with that. Um, and so... <laughs> Yeah, but it, it, it did take a great bit of research. Um, I think what was fortunate was because this is 
this was the third iteration in this world, I'd had time to build up. And like I said, um, when I really fleshed out the world um, just before I wrote The Haunting of Tramcar 015, that just provided me with a, a great roadmap. I literally made a timeline. <laughs> and I just kept that timeline open. And so I knew where things were and when things had happened. And I knew like, and me, could, me knows it, like, you create all this stuff, like you said, you can get granular, but you're not going to use it all. You, you can't. And so I had to pick, like, what do I want to use? Where do I want to put it in? Oh, this is good. Let me make sure I tantalize people with this. I don't even know what this means, but sure, I'm going to throw it in here. I hope I, I never have to fully explain it. <laughs> yeah, right? And so, I think that's yeah, wrong, that was, but I'm going to pretend. Yeah, exactly. So that, there, was, there was a lot of that. And it was just, I tried to, I mean, there was research, but, you know, like I always say, my research was driven by what I wanted the story to be. Um, and I always found out interesting little tidbits uh, here and there. And uh, then I was fortunate enough to have a reader from Cairo who could show me through the things where they were like, uh, here, here, that's good, that's good, that's not, that's good, that's, good, that's not. And uh, that really helped me. It was like I had put it all together, but now I could polish it a bit. And so that, that was great. That's excellent. Well, you've both, um for some amazing stories. So um, a master of gin and the chosen and the beautiful. Um, master of gin is an alternate fantasy history set in Cairo, 1912. There is mystery. Him. It might just, the end of the world may happen. You know? um, the chosen and the beautiful is a retelling of The Great Gatsby focused on Jordan Baker, who is magical and wonderful and full of energy. It's like a literary feast. Um, so two fabulous books. Our bookseller um, this evening is Acapella. They are a great friend of um, the Georgia Center for the Book, the AJC Decatur Book Festival, all of Atlanta across the country. And also remember your local libraries, um, independent bookstores um, we love, like Acapella, but also please remember your libraries are sometimes um, the heart of our communities. Um, and so I want to thank both of you. Thank you, thank you for these books and your time. I had a great time speaking with you. Um, and thank you to our attendees for joining this event. And just a reminder that we have two more weeks in our Jocelyn Jackson Reed series, and it is brought to you by the Georgia Center for the Book and the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Decatur Book Festival presented with Emory University, it's a mouthful, um, but also the DeKalb Library Foundation, the DeKalb County Public Library, um, who've been longtime supporters of um, these events. And this partnership with Georgia Center for the Book has made all of this possible. So thank you all for attending. Thank you authors for being here and for our attendees. Please get these books, share them with your book clubs and we hope to see you soon. Thank you everyone.